Hi everyone, welcome back to the show and today we've got a doozy for you. Today I'd love to talk to you about trading structures and making sure that if you're starting a business, getting it done right, or if you're in business, chatting to us as your accountant to make sure that the right structure you're in at the moment is beneficial for the future because I have to say there's an economic upturn coming up at the moment. So stay tuned and we'll chat to you in more detail soon. Bobby, great intro to your show this week. I couldn't, couldn't wait to talk to you about this. We, you just said there's an economic upturn coming. We can see in West Australia where we are that the mining industry is starting to open new mines and so forth. There is movement coming in. And this is probably a time when you're either setting up a new business to get your structures right or you need to take a look at your existing business mm-hmm. to make your structures right. That's exactly right, Michael. It's, um, I'd love, I love to tell people it's yeah. things that on the up. Yeah. You know, we're, in our area in Inglewood, we've got offices being leased out that have been vacant for 12 plus months. We've got people getting more revenue in their businesses, clients of ours that are getting more revenue in their businesses. Yeah, that, that they, they were previously, previously struggling. struggy. Um, um, the, the, the luxury, luxury market's going, going up with more cars and more luxury, luxury bikes and, and properties being, being sold. sold. That'll it's make Elf Babagello happy. Most <laughs> the luxury car dealer in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went to a property seminar last week and, oh, yeah. and the Property has gone on the rise. So wow. I have a really good feeling for WA in the next six to 12 months. So it may not be as big as it was, you know, in the boom time, yep. but, you know, it's, it's, it's on turning the around. It is interesting you say that because I've been looking at some commercial premises and I've noticed that they are starting to move now. The incentives don't have to be as great anymore. They're starting to move. But I suppose one of the things that a lot of people, when booms come along and they miss out, they say they miss yes. out or they're not able to capitalize. And a lot of my history has been that I have a look at the structure yes. and they're just not able to capitalize. What is it about business structures that makes it so important from an accounting perspective to be able to capitalize on these upturns? Well, the biggest thing I've seen is people that are coming to us as, as new clients. I've mm-hmm. looked at their structure and going, hey, for whatever reason, your previous advisor set you up with this entity, okay, that may have been good yeah. five, ten years ago, but your situation has now changed and you've, your account's never reviewed it. So uh, why? Uh, for example, people that are earning $150,000 taxable income still trading as a sole trader. I'm like, there's a lot of ways you can maximise that by trading through various other entities. Um, and that's where we're, we're seeing a lot of people go, yeah, I'm actually doing all right. Why, why am I paying you know, upwards to... 45% tax. Yes. You know, so there's there's a lot of people that are coming to us and, and realizing, just having that conversation with with a fresh mm. set of eyes and realizing, hey, maybe maybe I should try something new. There's a lot of things with businesses, and we hear talks from both ends of politics now talking about, I call them death duties. I don't care what they call them. <laughs> I die, I pass my inheritance <laughs> off to the kids, they're going to pay tax on it. And I hate the thing, actually. But anyway, but the rich, the rich, yeah. it doesn't bother them because they're already structured correctly. For a company, it's very similar, isn't it? It's you need to structure your company to protect your money and your assets. That's right, and that's why company structure is one of my favourites for a business that we know, and you, as the client or the, the starting business owner, knows that it's going to grow into you know a mass revenue um, earning business. Yes. Reason why. I always go, okay, cool. Yes, it's the most complex structure and most expensive to set up and run um, accounting-wise day-to-day. Yeah. But if you know you're going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit, you might as well cap that at, at the company tax rate, which at the moment is 27.5%. That's one of the biggest uh, benefits of the company. But you hit the nail on the head with protecting your personal cash and personal assets. Mm. And, for example, if you're a sole trader, and you get sued, or your insurance doesn't cover something, or your creditors, or the the litigate, the litigation is going to come for you in the, your personal bank account, your family home, mm. your kids' assets, your wife's assets, all that stuff, because you are the business. Now, in WA, we're in Perth, West Australia. Now, I dare say it's, it's very similar across some of uh, the other countries uh, that are probably listening. But in WA, we do have a predominant uh, number of family-owned 
businesses. Yes. They're owned by the family, they're run by the family. Yes, they have employees as well. Are there certain aspects to having a family-owned business that they need to be aware of from accounting? Most definitely. It's one of the things I look at is each client that comes to us, I look at their each individual situation because, mm. as you know, every client is has a different story. Yes. You may, have, you may be slightly older and you've got um, over 18 age children, which you may want to distribute some profits through to, and what's the yeah. benefit, what's the best way to do that. Yeah. Um, you may have newborn kids, and, well, hey, yes, I've got a kids, but is a trust structure going to be the best for me because I can't really distribute much to my under 18 aged yes. kids. So, and what's my best in terms of uh, asset protection? Is the trust structure solely going to be best for me, or um, mm. should I just go through the trading company? Yeah, and have a few various different ways of shareholdings and things like that. So each client is different. Yeah, and that's that's what I like to say is let's look at your each individual situation and see which structure is the best. What's becoming really popular now, and I know when the upturns come, family-owned businesses there. Let's have not not a board of directors because you've got to pay a board of directors, and then you've got to do what the board tells you. But they put in these advisory boards, and they seem to invite their accountant onto the board, I mean, they pay them for their time, and they sit on their boards. What's the benefit, if you're having an advisory board, just to get a better perspective of your business, help you grow, what's the advantage of the accountant being on that board with you? Well, with family-owned businesses, you, you, most times you, your eyes are just uh, you know, tunnel vision. Yeah. So having that third-person financial advisor accountant on, on the actual advisory board will show you, with the numbers, how the business is actually going. Um, if you're a larger own family business, we can go into a bit more detail in terms of where money is going, what's the return on investment on each um, you know, asset purchase. For example, if you own a farm, um, you know, what's the cost of this tractor and how's that going to go? Mm. It doesn't really matter how large of a business needs to be. We do that with um, smaller family owned businesses as well. Yes. But at that larger family business level, you really need to ensure that the money that you're spending is going to be worthwhile to project your revenue. You find when you're on one of those advisory boards and you're dealing with the family, you've got you've got the boss, either mum or dad, or both, <laughs> and then you've got the kids getting involved. Is it? Do you find that being on those and independent, you're able to just take the emotion out of things and give really advice that they can all relate to? Well, I've been in a few of those meetings, and yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> mum and dad, you've got your two uni-aged um, children there, um, yep. everyone's squabbling which, with which way they want to direct the business because mm. the kids know they're going to inherit it, mum and dad are retiring in the next few years <laughs> and we just have to stop everyone and go, hey, listen, let's just look at the facts right now. Yes, Yes, you are retiring in two to five years. Mm. Which one of your children is going to take control? Are both going to have equal control? Which one's the, a lot of the times, one's yep. more of a hands-on person and the other child's more of a numbers person. So yeah. in, in that sense, who's going to be the, uh, you know, the, the office person, who's going to be the hands-on and yeah. make sure that we're all working together yes. as, because we want the business to continue into, uh, into the future. Interesting to say continue into the future. You've, as well as owning Ultimate Tax and Advisory and being the head of that and it's your own business, but you have worked in some major accounting firms yourself and got the experience how complex does it become in these family businesses? You're talking about carrying on in the future. For succession planning, how important is that to be discussed with an accountant now, especially as an upturn in the market coming? Yes. Uh, how important is that and when should they really start discussing it? Before any of that happens, really, because it's yeah. with business, you, you have to look at your short-term goals. When you, the ultimate goal is your, your end plan, so your succession plan. Yes. And that's what's mum and dad doing. What are the kids going to do? Are they going to buy into the business? Or they're not buying potentially. Yeah. They may, mum and dad may want cash. <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's just inherited. You're just going to yes. take over. The and they get a resi then mum and dad might have a residual yeah, income exactly. coming in. Yeah, I suppose it's different for everyone. It is different for everyone. Yeah. But with that, it's more what structure have you got right now? Is that the best situation for when the two kids take on? Yes. So we look at. Why, let's look at potentially changing structures right now mm. to make the most uh, beneficial tax-wise, mm. beneficial for succession planning, for future uh, directors and shareholders. Because depending mm. on how big the business goes, you may want to have third-party investors, yep. third-party directors. 
um, or do, do the kids and mum and dad just want to keep it family owned only? Mm. So it's that's that's always a discussion that needs to be had before any major family life issues come into play. <laughs> now, I've got to ask you, there's a couple of curly questions, but it's a good show. The, uh, the, 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 the upturn is coming. And for someone like myself, you know, I've built several businesses and I kind of build them in the downturn. And people say, when should you start a business? And I go, build it in the downturn because you can make it successful then. When the upturn comes, it's going to be really successful and you can sell it. <laughs> so someone, I mean, this one I won't sell. I absolutely love it. But in other businesses that I've been in, I've looked at that. Now, there must be a lot of business owners, maybe tired, they've been it long enough, they've been waiting for their retirement, the upturn's coming. What are some of the points now they really need to look at if they're going to start preparing a business for sale? Can, they, can accountants help them start doing the paperwork so it's attractive to most a buyer? Definitely, most definitely. One thing I like to look at is how is the business going in the downturn? Are you profitable? Are you yep. just getting by with paying yourself a wage? Or are you paying yourself a decent wage, but let's say the company is not profitable? So effectively, you're, you're buying a wage. Yes. So what industry are you in? Let's look, have a look at the trends of what's happened in the past of when it's been up and down and just see what happens, what's happened in your particular industry. So this is where I like to get very specific with each individual client. There's no cookie cutter operation <laughs> here. It's all individualized. It's all specific. Yes. But what I like to look at is how can you maximize your systems now to ensure that when there is an economic upturn and you are hiring more staff, uh, you are getting a bigger premises, you're mm. getting more and more equipment, that everything's all systemized with when you grow to, to I guess, complement the increase in revenue and um, ensure that you are getting the, you know, a wage in your pocket and the yeah. company or, or business is profitable. It's interesting you talk about you do your research and we know this that you do. You did a show and I encourage people to watch it and you're showing which uh, types of businesses are attractive and which aren't. Right. And there was a really curly one, very interesting one. And it, I think it was the cafe one that runs yes. seven days a week, no one interested, but a five day a week in the city, the nine to five, booming. You have a great memory. Yes, yeah, that's, <laughs> that, was a, that was a great show and a great conversation. And most definitely, so let's look at the trends in mm. that particular industry to say why has a seven-day restaurant cafe gone mm. down? What, why, what's, what's lost the appeal to buying those businesses? Because, you know, five, ten years ago, that, they were up, up on top. They were up on top. Yeah. Is it because you've got access, because I didn't have access to but because you've got access to trends like that, you're able to extrapolate what's working for a certain industry and then apply it to somebody else's business and say, look, these are the good points, let's apply it to you so you can maximize your sale price or your profits today. Exactly. So let's just go back to that restaurant example. Mm. Why is a seven day business not operating as well as a, a half a day, five day a week business? Yeah. I'm really seeing why that's happened in the last four or five years is because of the economic downturn. Your seven day breakfast to dinner restaurants, yeah. a lot of people aren't going out for dinner anymore. They may be going for a cheap brunch or, or, a, or a casual lunch these days and, and yeah. cooking their main meal at home. So that's one of the biggest things. So as soon as that trend changes and the uh, seven day a week restaurants come up, well, you know that, hey, maybe something's actually coming on something's with, uh, coming with on. the economic, yeah. economic upturn. So. I think from that show, so you're saying there's a lot of people looking when they get into business now, very particular about lifestyle. And one of the other trends that you picked up on was caravan parks. Mm. It, it's interesting you picked the, the trends up, like the people looking for a business that will give them a lifestyle as well as an income. That's right. A lot so, of people love that. Yeah. yeah. So when you work with your clients, are you also, as well as being the numbers guy, when I like how you do business strategic planning, you do your, you do your reviews with people on a very regular basis, you don't leave them year to year. Um, is this what you're also looking for? Okay, let's have a look at if people want a lifestyle, how can we build that in? If people want this, how do we build that in? How does, it, how does this one-on-one -on -one work with you when you do this consulting with your, what I would call your premium clients, yeah. but you know your business owners that say, yeah. I want to grow? So I'm going to work with you. I'll give you, just step back a little bit. Yeah. I'll give you a perfect example with a fantastic client that she, she came to us. She's 50 years old. She yeah. knows she's not going to be working in her shift work, um, you know, five days a week yeah. for, for, you know, 15 years. She's gone, Bobby, listen, I really want to come and uh, to start a business or mm. buy a business. I've got cash. I've got equity. I can get funding, but I just don't know what business is right for me. So yeah. we had a look at her situation and she's got a, a, a 
ill mother that that's, doesn't live with her but lives mm. close by and she goes, I don't, the shift work isn't really working for me because mum mm. needs me close by as, as she gets older and older. I kind of don't really want to do shift work for the, <laughs> you know, another 15 years before I retire. So we've looked at the various types of businesses that she that were, were good for her, maybe just her only in the business or mm. maybe one or two staff to help her out. And we found the perfect business for her is a news agency. Oh. So that was just something that we both discussed. Obviously, it's her decision as well. We've just mm. gone through the various types. You know, she, she had the idea of a small little cafe. And I was like, well, do you really want to get up at 4 a.m. every day and prepare meals and, and potentially yes. serve hundreds of couple, thousands of customers a day? You never know how busy no. your shop is going to be. She's like, you know what? I don't really want to wake up that early. So we found the perfect niche for her is that news agency lottery kiosk. And she was, she was said, that's a fantastic idea. Yes. So that's one of the things that where I look at your personal situation. Like I said, no cookie cutter. No cookie, no cookie cutter. In, in <laughs> here. It's all personalized. It's all individualized. And to ensure mm. that whatever you, whatever venture you want to start or want to take over is mm. going to be the best for your succession. So we're looking at what are say two or three of the main points you get people to look at in their structure. To, I know it's different for everyone, yes. but is there like two or three areas that you go, okay, these are the these are three areas that we really need to focus on to make sure they work for you. So the best thing I'd like to look at is one, what structure is going to be the best for you. So let's look nine times out of ten, it's a company because a lot mm. of clients that are starting businesses for us are generally young, so yes. a trust structure uh, won't really work for them. They've got no one to distribute money to, so they might as well just be a sole trader for right. tax purposes. But anyway, <laughs> the second thing I like to see is what industry you're looking at to get in and have you done your due diligence? So mm. have you done the market research? Have you seen what your demographic's going to be? Have you seen the trends that's happened in the last few years with that particular industry to ensure that, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to set the business up for you and uh, ensure that it's going to, you know, Good for good for us because we get a little bit of coin yeah. to start off with, um, yeah. and yeah, you may be a client of ours, but we actually want you to be a client of ours for years and years. Mm. Um, lastly, oh, that's a tough one. I just like to make sure that people understand their cash flow obligations. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, because there's a lot of times when people start a business coming from being uh, coming from paid employment, mm. they haven't had the stresses of uh, looking for clients. They haven't had stresses of no, uh, negotiating with suppliers or finding premises. So they're yeah. just going to this with a whole new fresh set of eyes. So yeah. that's one of the biggest things that I like to say uh, to them and use us as an example. Same situation, only mm. been employed prior to starting this business. Yes, we've made mistakes, but we've learned fast from them. Mm. And that's the main thing is to, then that's cash flow was one of the biggest things we learned fast from. Mm. So they're the top three things I'd they're like to talk about. <laughs> yeah. In an economic up upturn, it's interesting you mentioned cash flow then. Cash flow seems to loosen up in an economic upturn. More money seems to come in. But there are also risks with that as well. We tend to think the company money is our money. <laughs> and everyone's going, it is, isn't it? <laughs> I'm the sole director. It's, it's my money, isn't it? I'll do what I want with it. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the ATO says no. <laughs> But that's where I, that's one of the things, I suppose that's point number four I talk with people is realize yeah. if you're starting a company, that's not your money. Yes, you're earning it. You're the only employee from the, um, you know, mm. onset. But going forward, you've got staff, you've got premises, you've got all these other bits and pieces, which, hey, the money needs to be retained in the company to yes. ensure that these expenses are being met. And that's where cash flow comes in. Mm. And you see the nail on the head. As economic upturn is there, more money is coming through, hopefully. Yes. And you know, you go, well, I've got all this money. I can just, I can spend it. I buy a plane. I'll buy, I'll buy a plane. <laughs> You'd love that, wouldn't you, Michael? Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> so, in those situations, we always look at, okay, if you are going to spend money, what's a good, what's the return on investment going to be? Mm. So, as I've mentioned in previous shows before. If you buy a new forklift for the for the factory, because there is more cash coming through, more clients coming, we need it. That's great. Do you need a new uh, Foxtel subscription for the, for the <laughs> office? Not really. Not really. What benefit is that going to have? Or you know, yeah. looking at upgrading your own. Let's say you you're a director of your own business and go. Money's coming in. I'm getting more of a wage. Yeah. Let's upgrade our premises. Mm. Let's go from a four hundred thousand dollar house. Let's buy. We can afford a million dollar house now. 
Wow. Yes. You know, and I've seen it happen. And yeah. I've, the advice I've given is that's great now, but think about in potentially three to four years' time when you've got this seven, eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage looming over your head and there's an economic downturn when there's no more money coming through. <sighs> yeah. Ouch. It's interesting you say that and you mentioned property then. It, when we can feel um, a, an upturn coming, a lot of businesses rent their premises. Mm -hmm. they, they don't own them. Is this the time when you start looking at these things to see what current rents they are, what the current outgoings, what they should be locking in on, you know, what they what they should be renegotiating? Definitely. Yeah. If you're in a position where your lease is nearing to its, its ending time, mm. um, have a chat with the landlord and go, listen, I want to, if you don't want to buy a commercial property and you're, yeah. you're happy with where you are, lock in for a longer term. If you know your business is viable and it's going to be there, lock in for a five, ten year term. The landlord would love you for it. Yes. They know they're going to get a guaranteed rental income for the next five or ten years. Yeah. But also for yourself, look at commercial property and say, hold on, is this premises where I'm leasing right now, is this going to uh, service me for the next five to ten years? Mm, very important. Man. So. If you've got a 50 square meter office now and you've, you're predicting your, your business is going to triple, let's say, for example, in five yes. years, do you need more staff? Do you need more warehouse space? Do you need mm. all, all these things come into play? Yes. And is your 50 square meter office going to suffice? So that's where you look at, hold on, it's actually more beneficial for me now. I've got the cash to put a big deposit on a commercial property. They're pretty cheap in an economic downturn. I may get one for a steal yeah. and, you know, potentially... Uh, lease it back to myself, the company will lease it back to yourselves as the owners. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the leasing back pays the mortgage repayments. Exactly or mortgage right. repayments, but you know, the long yeah, repayments. Exactly right. So a lot of the ways I like to structure is mm. commercial properties owned by your family trust. Okay. The, fa the family trust leases it to your company. Obviously, it has to be at market rate, so you, yeah. you can't overinflate the rent because mm -hmm. that's when the tax office goes starts knocking on your door. Yeah. But effectively, your your business mm. is not paying a landlord rent; it's paying yourself the yeah. rent. So you're paying yourself. You said something that was interesting, and I only know this because of talking to yourself. The trust can own the property and lease it to you. There are a few that run self-managed super funds. Yes. But as in my knowledge from what we've talked to, a self-managed super fund can't, your self-managed super fund can't buy a property and lease it back to you. It is very difficult to, yeah. yeah. Well, well you, you can if it's a, it's a separate entity. So you may be a director oh, okay. of a company, you're able to lease it back to you. So that's, that's no problem at all. Right, okay. But then, um, it's more if you bought a house in a super yes. fund and then tried to rent the house. That's correct. Then you, that's not a, that's a no-go zone. If you buy your house to live in under your super fund, then unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great, but no, unfortunately not. But, uh, mean. But, yeah, mean, yes. But uh, there, but is, the, there yeah. is new changes coming up. Well, um, one of the biggest banks have stopped lending for super funds as of two weeks ago. The, to my understanding, it was called wow. the Bank of Australia, the CBA. Really? Yeah, so that, that's out of the big four banks. I believe it's only mm. one. I believe it's Westpac that's, that's only. What would have driven that? Is it because the super fund's protected and they can't get their money? Well, no, it's, just, it's just because the, uh, the, the, super, the the bank will always get their money, regardless. Right. So there's, mm. it's a complex structure that's set up, which is, we'll chat for another day. <laughs> but effectively, yeah. new laws came in probably about 10 years ago where mm. super funds could lend, uh, uh, you know, to buy, have, have a yeah. loan against uh, investments, be it yeah. shares, be it property. Lots of stringent rules and regulations mm. against it. Accountants hate it because it's a you know you have to make sure every single box is checked and yeah. you know uh, the loans are being repaid all that type of stuff. Yeah. So um, that's one of the reasons why uh, the banks have stopped against it because they feel that it's not a longevity issue. Right. But, and in my opinion, I feel the ATL will probably uh, take a back step and, and take funding away from mm. new super funds yeah. uh, going forward. So the but the commercial property being owned by the, the family trust, yeah. say for instance, and then leasing it back, that's a simpler structure for people to consider? That's one of the easiest ways. Rather than having it in your own name personally, yes. um, as mum and dad directors, having mm. it in the family trust where it's once again protected via, via the, uh, the, the asset protection, yes. having the company acting as trustee, mm. um, lot of lot of complex names <laughs> whittling out here. But, 
having it in your family trust yeah. is give you the most asset protection for whatever happens outside of the company yep. in trading terms and whatever happens in yourself personally. Mm. So in economic upturns, it's not just the increase in business that you can be looking at the sales, it's, it's your actual structures so you can be actually maximizing your profits in, in a whole range of areas. Definitely, and that's exactly right. It's all about maximizing the profits, mm. minimizing the tax, making sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck for your business. Mm. Someone coming to you that's already in business, been in business for quite a few years, and they don't understand this. How, how hard is it, how complex is it, or what levels do you take them to, and how do you get their head around this? So, you know, it might be retiring in five or 10 years, yeah. and going, I just don't understand it, but I've heard trust, I've heard, you know, leasing, I've, it's just, look, I was a, I was a carpenter. Yes. I got into business because I'm a carpenter. I'm just really good at carpentry. I build great roofs and houses. I'm fantastic. But this is a bit beyond me. How does that work with an accountant helping them forward? Well, as always, I speak with each person individually. Mm -hmm. Make sure they understand our... I put everything into layman terms yeah. as best as possible. Yeah. Making sure that they understand what I'm talking about. Because if they are going to retire in five to ten years' time, if they're at that, that stage of their life cycle, mm. then we have to ensure if changing structures now is worthwhile, what can they do to maximize for sale in the five to 10 years time? Yeah. Do they have kids that want, who are trade tradespeople as well um, and, and want to take over the family business? Mm. Is that something that needs to be done? So we ensure that we uh, it, that everything is done correctly at each step of the, yeah. in each phase of what you want to happen. So if you do want to sell, we want to go, okay, how do we maximize um, profits for mm. a potential buyer to, to want to pay premium for. I suppose when someone's sitting with you as well, the other end of the scale, that, and, and, a, and a few companies I've met, well, I won't make, name them, but their, their growth strategy is one, grow your sales and grow what they call organic sales, but then they would grow by acquisition. Mm. And I suppose when you're looking at an economy like ours in Perth now, or any economy that's going to start growing, you can feel it bubbling away. There are now opportunities to grow your business by acquisition. Mm. What are some of the complexities that an accountant would look at before I just got excited and went, but it looks great, Bobby. I'm sorry, I met the guy and he's fantastic. <laughs> They're always lovely, aren't they? Yes. People want to sell their business for a million dollars. He's told yeah. me it's, it's yeah. a correct business as well. So what I like to look at, and I've seen this mistake happen in the past, is people yeah. have gone, at, great, I'm signing on the dotted line, before chatting to us as your accountant. <laughs> so after they've signed and accepted the offer, they're, they're the sellers, they're, they're laughing all the way to the bank because they've got... Literally. 60, they've, yeah, exactly, because they know in 60 days they're selling their potentially lower profiting business for a million dollars or, or whatever. It mm, might be. Yes. So what I like to do is, once again, do your due diligence. Look at what's happened in the trends over the past five years. Have mm. there been ups? Have there been downs? And why all of a sudden it's gone from down to up, have they been potentially fraudulently increasing fees to clients? Well, not fraudulently, but you know, mm. aggressively increasing fees to clients. That so could cause a drop off that's later exactly on as right. clients catch on. You've gone from, let's say, billings of $1,000 per client to mm. $2,500 per client. Yes. The clients are happy because, or potentially happy because they've known that person for the last 10, let's say it's a service industry, yes. for the last 10 years, they've got a rapport and loyalty with them. Little mm. do they know he's, he's going to sell the business. Yes. And all of a sudden, the business is worth a million dollars, mm. selling it to you for a million dollars, and then all of a sudden, the clients uh, you know, come on board to you, and you, who are you? Where, where, where did Tim go? Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or Janice, or yeah. whatever it may be. And, yeah. and all of a sudden, hold on, yeah, those fees, let's let's have a review of my financials. Mm. And then you see, okay, well, this million dollar business was only worth five hundred thousand. Yeah. It was interesting you say that. There was an instance where I was looking at uh, for another company, not being accountable, but just from business set of eyes. And he asked me to look at it and I said, It just doesn't add up. You're gonna pay five million for this business, but it doesn't have any staff on its mm. books. Yeah, mum and dad are there and the daughter works in there. And I went, But you only have to walk into the place and look and there's people everywhere. And what it was, was they had people help them, but it was the cash economy yes. days. Mm -hmm. They were paying these people cash, but because it wasn't physically drawing money off the business, mm -hmm. they could increase the profits of the business. So on paper, look great, but as soon as you bought it, yeah. you needed to employ mum, dad, daughter, and these five other people who then went, put their poor out and went, yep. 
pay me. <laughs> exactly right. And that's what people, that's what things we like to see you don't see on the profit and loss or don't see on the balance sheet is these unknown figures. And unfortunately, the cash economy is still alive and thriving as mm. much as the tax office doesn't want it to be, but it's yeah. there. Yeah. And um, we we try and mitigate it as much as possible with our clients and, and uh, you know, say don't deal with people that operate mm. in those industries because, no. you know, it, it's what benefit is to you. So all, all yeah. family and friends just say, listen, don't, don't bother with the cash coin because you, yeah. you don't know what it's doing. You don't, you don't really know what it's doing. So in, in the acquisition phase, is acquisitions a good thing for a business to also consider? It's a very aggressive form of growth, right. which is you know, great for a, a certain point in time. Let's say you've grown your business so far through referrals and, and organic growth, and mm. you've, it's come to a point where, listen, the, the, the rate of, of growth isn't as fast as it was or isn't it what, where we want it to be. Mm. So it's just a, another way of fast-tracking growth. Yes, you have to outlay some capital and and or get funding for it, yeah. but it's 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 a good growth, definitely a good growth strategy. When you look at that, depending on the business, obviously, when you look at the company, do you have a look then at the customers it's serving, the products and services it's serving, and are you as an accountant then looking for gaps like then? Well, if you pick this client base up, no one's doing this one, and that is something you can add to it immediately. Exactly. So that's where you look at businesses that are potentially failing and just selling because they. They can't. They, they can't. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, what is, what's they the can't question? deliver. They can't deliver. Yeah. Yes. The customers are there, but they're only getting that one service or that one mm. product. Yeah. How do you maximise that? Either with adding further services, if you, if you mm. do by adding further services on your own, or doing joint ventures with other people and saying, yeah. hey, "Listen, we've got a great. Um, I don't know. Let's say uh, you're a carpenter. Let's yeah. say I've got a great uh, cabinet maker or." Whatever yeah. it may be, a painter that can help out with this, and mm. you know the clients will love you for it. Yeah, so it's looking at all those things. So we've talked about structure, we've talked about growth, and uh, I suppose people are looking, going, how do I know I'm going to get an accountant? Obviously, they come to you to get an accountant. Uh, what are some of the key points? Do you think, like, with your accountancy, what are some of the key points you do to enable you deliver that service that you think they should look for? They, they analyze an accounting firm. Well, the biggest thing I like to say is, do you have a good rapport on the first meeting? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people put their, you know, their, their good face on in all meetings, which is which is fine because first impressions do count. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what's your gut feeling with this person? Do you feel that they're not telling the whole truth, or do you feel that they're being very open and honest with you? We're at our firm. We're very open and honest with new clients, and and yeah. we say what we can and what we can't do. Um, yeah. So we're, we're very straight. You even give them the bad news as well. Of course, yeah, that's <laughs> because if you don't give them the bad news, then all of a sudden, three months later, hold on, I'm meant to pay X amount of tax, or you know, I, why mm. aren't you doing this for me? Oh, well, you didn't ask. Yeah, and that's the thing. We try and answer your questions, which you don't know to ask. Yeah. So that's one thing that what we do, but that's something which definitely, if you're looking at an account or having a meeting with them to discuss with them, the second mm. thing is, what are their fee-based structures? How how have they organised your fees? Have they given you a a detailed quote or if they just give me one lump sum and, and say we'll do this, we'll do that, but mm. then there's nothing in there's all all the ways there's always going to be fine print. So make sure it's all detailed in the quote. Mm. Um, and do they offer a fixed fee? Yeah. Or are they, or are they just going to do everything billed? You know, mm. if you call me for five minutes, I'm billing you a hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, let's let's have it that's one of the things which is changing in the our service based industries. Lawyers are doing it as well. Yeah. Financial planners, to some extent, are doing it as well. So yeah. instead of uh, you getting a bill, an unknown bill from us, mm. we know that we've already quoted you. You've yeah. got, we've got you on a monthly retainer. Mm. Everyone's happy. You, you know you can call me up you know, yeah. fee-free. <laughs> One of the things I like with you, and we're talking about structures getting them right, and we're talking about an economy now going on the upturn. One thing that you deliver for your clients, I just want to just touch on as we wrap up, is this strategic planning you do with clients. And you've got a, quite a few clients to take advantage of this and, and their businesses are just taking off, which is not surprising. You focus on something and it grows. What is this about and, and why is it getting the results? Well, it's back to that discussion we had earlier today about having that advisory meeting mm. and ensuring that you have your, your, the business owners have that tunnel vision, ensuring us as the accountant give you that third person aspect. Go, hey, yes, it's growing, 
but why is it growing? And let's look at the intricate details. Let's look at your marketing. Let's look at what you've done to your premises. Let's look at how your staff interact with customers, yeah. which is something which other accountants I found just don't understand because mm. they're just sitting behind the desk for 90% of the day. They don't go out and visit the clients. They're, mm. they're chained to the desk. And they're, 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 or, uh, typical accounts are scared to interact with other people and have a, have a social life. <laughs> but effectively, that's what I do. Let's right. look at what's, what are you doing on that you can physically see on the books yeah. and what are, what are you doing that you're not seeing on the books? Are you doing more mm. networking? Are you, are, are you employing the right staff? Yes, mm. you've got wages on your bill, but are the right staff? And you can definitely see that in an increase in profits or, yeah. or, or turnover, I should say. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's interesting because you also, as an accounting firm, offer that strategic planning advice. How often do you do that with clients? We do it as, as frequently as you like. Mm. Some clients we meet every single month and right. have, a, have an advisory meeting to go over the budgets, go over their marketing plan, go over their strategy, which what they want to attack with yeah. potential new uh, contracts to, to obtain. So we talk about that monthly. So these are the clients that are aggressively growing yes. who just want to stay laser focused. That's right. They just want to be on track. They don't want to veer away from the path. Yeah. And they want to ensure that they're getting that they're having that conversation with us as an independent person outside the business to yeah. ensure that they are going on the right path. Fantastic. Um, I, a lot of clients for us like to meet every quarter, which is our our GST bass lodgement uh, time. It's frame. a good time. It isn't is it? a good time because it, yeah. it's ninety days. It's not too infrequent. They're happy with how they're growing. They kind of want just an oversee to see what's happened mm. you know, on a third person view. Um, mm. And ninety days is perfect for us as well. Yeah. Um, some clients just prefer to us to do a once a year tax planning meeting. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't like to I do only those because I feel the benefit for clients to meet with us is mm. uh, you, know, you have staff and you have yourself working the business, but you, you really need uh, you know, a frequent conversation with mm. us as your advisor to ensure that your business is tracking where you want it to go. It's interesting economy that's coming up. And one of the things that yourself and Crystal have, have brought into your business to to obviously capitalize on this upturn that's coming is the bookkeeping services. Why would an accountancy firm want an in-house bookkeeping service in it and you wouldn't just go, well, just get a bookkeeper and get them to send me the books? Well, at the end of the day, external bookkeepers, you as, a, as the accountants, we have to review it anyway. Right. Um, so an external bookkeeper, we have no idea their operations, how they do things, are they, are they putting things in the right spots um, are they claiming mm. things the, the, the best way? Because it's going to take us potentially hours to, to review um, at the end of the year to ensure that things are being done correctly yeah. and clients do pay a top dollar for that. Whereas if we have our own in-house bookkeeper, which we do, yeah. I review it personally before um, the, the, the end of month or end of quarter financials go, right. to the, go to the client so I know what's actually happening. And then when the client calls me up to have a chat about it, I can actually give them a detailed answer right off the top of the bat without them, you know, without me having to sleuth through uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of transactions to ensure things are being done correctly. Right. But having that in-house bookkeeping and why we want to grow that is because there's that economic upturn and business owners who were previously doing it themselves, they just don't have time. They're going to get too busy. They're going to get too busy yes. and the books are going to fall behind. They're going to get late lodgement penalties from the tax office because the, the quarterly GST hasn't been lodged. And, we don't want that. Oh, exactly. And, you know, upward, they're, they're getting nasty mm. up to it's $1,000 per penalty. Wow. And that's something as a, yes, it, it's an economic upturn, but do you really want to pay the tax office an extra $1,000 for no reason? Not, not, <laughs> a, not, a, not a chance. No. But we, we're going to wrap, I'm conscious of your time, we're going to wrap up. But for, for businesses now who are looking at structure, looking at upturns, What's a couple of pieces of takeaway advice you give them to have a look at today or this week? Then go, just have a look at this and ask yourself the question if this is working and if not, come and see us. What would you say a couple of things are? So the first three things I'd say is one, how have your profits gone in the last few financial years and how's the tax that you've been paying over the last few years? That's the biggest indicator I'd look at first. Two, look at what your growth strategy is. Are you looking to grow your business? Are you looking to sell? Are you looking to inherit it to your children or other or, uh, or potential other uh, current business partners? Mm -hmm. And three, make sure that your systems are correct because when the economic upturn does come, 
cash flow is going to come uh, faster than you can think of and you really need to ensure that those systems are in place so that you're not spending money money willy nilly <laughs> Fantastic, Bobby. Ultimate Tax and Advisory. You've got to tell them. How do they contact you? You can contact our office, which is uh, on Beaufort Street in Inglewood, 868 Beaufort Street, Inglewood, on 08 6144 3370.